There's no space that his love can't reach. There's no place where we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing. Welcome to this week's sermon follow up video. Hopefully, you guys have been enjoying them. Hope you're having a good week. We are now in our fourth week of our current series, The Glorious Mission. And uh, we're going to be looking at, or we have looked at, Paul's second missionary journey. And it's keeping with our theme of surrender, this one is entitled Surrendered Argument, and, and uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a good, good week for you guys in home groups, we believe. Uh, <clears throat> so, Gordon, let me ask you to kind of give us the flyover real quick, kind of overview of this passage, and then we're going to zoom in on a few things. Well, as we talk about on Sunday, um, this particular section, the second missionary journey, it's, it's Paul's longest. Uh, it has some tremendous stories that I wish, if we had the time, we could explore each and every one of them because they're all extremely valuable. But for the sake of both the sermon as well as for our discussion questions for this week, I just really chose one that was especially meaningful to me or one that I hope will help you guys out a lot, and that's really the exchange that Paul has in Athens with the Athenians. Uh, Mars Hill, however your Bibles really have it labeled, uh, it's one of those great passages that, that discusses for us what it means to engage a truly a pagan culture, a culture that is completely distant from God. And part of the reason why I chose that, one is its familiarity. I love the passage. Maybe some of you are familiar with it and go to it often. But another reason why I've chosen it is just because I really do feel like uh, the passage out of Acts 17 at the end of the chapter, which is the Athenian passage, that it really speaks to even our modern context. Uh, there are so many things about it that I think can speak to us today. Sometimes we feel like Scripture uh, is hard for us to relate to a modern day. Now, I don't believe that's the case. I believe there's always a universal principle that God is trying to teach us. But in this particular case, I feel like it just jumps off the page. And so that's why we chose to go with, that's why I chose to go with the passage where Paul engages the Athenians uh, at the end of 17. Yeah, it's super applicable. Very, very cool. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and jump into the questions. The first one isn't one that we would really expect you to spend a whole lot of time. It's kind of more of just a a get you thinking question, yeah. kind of prime the pump. And that first question is this, is Paul seemed to have gospel ambition, whether alone or with fellow evangelists. Are we more likely to speak up when we're alone or with fellow saints? Uh, and how can we use it for a gospel advantage? Yeah, so, I mean, that last question, how can we use it for a gospel advantage? What I mean by that is how can you use the answer that you have to the previous question? How can I use that for my advantage? And the answer that, we're, that I want to draw out is, and there's not a right or wrong in this. It's in, in this case, this is the one particular occasion where Paul appears to be very much on his own. Uh, and I find that interesting. I don't really know necessarily all that Luke wants to convey with that. Uh, and maybe he just doesn't talk about others and there are others with him. But really, it seems pretty clear that Paul enters Athens. He goes to Athens totally alone or with few of his, Silas does not go, Timothy does not go, uh, and so it, it appears as though Paul may be somewhat on his own, and, and really there's not a right or wrong answer to this, that middle question of are you more likely to speak up when you're alone or when you're with your fellow saints. The invitation or the challenge that I guess I wanted to draw out in that is that we have opportunities all over the place to recognize, to, to see where God is at work, and to engage a culture. Uh, sometimes we do that in sort of the camaraderie of one another. Do you look for occasions of where you and a friend or a handful of friends just kind of walk into a situation where the gospel might make an appearance and you find strength, you find strength in being together in that process. And that's a good thing. And so, or are you a person who just really likes to kind of go out and just tackle a situation head on, just on your own? Um, and it just really, for me, sparked an interesting way to, to, to approach this, to see what it is that God, how God would use you as an individual, and then even in our home groups and things like that, how would he use you as a home group? Uh, just to really, as, as Kyle said, to, to, spark the, to spark the conversation is really all I wanted to, to do. So Yeah, and a lot of it is a, it's a personality thing. Right. You know, and for me, I think probably if I'm in a large group of, I guess it depends on the situation, but sometimes when there's a large group of Christians, we can have the tendency to just talk to each other. Right. Know, other times, if we're intentional about it, like you right. said, we're, we're going to work together towards a specific goal, then we can be more effective. And it, it, yeah, it's situational, it's personality, but yeah. it's a good thing to, it's good to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Out. And I mean, it's, it's, you know, Paul leaves 
Thessalonica and then Berea. And in Berea, he's chased out by the Thessalonian Jews. So he ultimately goes to uh, Athens again. It appears somewhat by himself. Well, all throughout that process, he has been working alongside of Silas and Timothy, and they've been working in conjunction with each other. And here we just find Paul what appears to be just completely alone. And, you know, the Bible very specifically says his heart was stirred or he was, you know, he was strongly, I mean, it, whatever your translation would say, whatever your version says, that he was provoked in his spirit. And so even by himself, he was like, God, I've got to take this opportunity. And, and so it's really kind of a neat thing. And so that's really what that question is intended to do. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. So spend as much time as you want on that, but uh, that's, not the, that's not the bulk of what we're going to get at. The second question here, this one, this one uh, you can spend quite a bit of time on yeah, probably and get, sure. get a lot of value in. And it's this. It says, do you wonder whether the things that disturb God disturb you? And do they, they disturb you kind of in that same way? Yeah. This one is, is really the, the money maker almost of the entire discussion question. The other two that follow this are hopefully also real helpful. But, but this really is, I think, the money maker that we have to walk away from is, do the things that break God's heart are the things that break his heart the things that break my heart? And, um, you know, a lot of what we've been talking about in this series and even the previous series, um, in the glorious mystery and then coming into the glorious mission where Paul is especially the character that we are looking at more deeply, it really is just an important question to ask, are you sure, are you confident <laughs> that the things that are disturbing you are the things that are disturbing God? Uh, and, and maybe in some ways they are, but are they in the same way? And all I mean by that is, um, am I kind of taking an, an angle on this particular offense in a way that God would never have intended? Uh, just to give you a very simple example, obviously the subject of sexuality, the subject of uh, gender identity, all of these things are just pressing in on us. And I, I do think it's a very important topic, and I challenge all of us to explore that deeply. But... We want to be very careful that we understand what, what is the priority, what is the ranking of things that we are, under, that we are going after. Uh, some of this we talked about, was it just last week? I don't know, in our discussion questions of, are the things that we are, that we are going after, are they the essential things, or are we attacking peripheral things? Right, right, yeah. um, and if someone is not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's, that's priority number one. Uh, they don't know how to be followers of Jesus Christ when they don't have the presence of Christ living within them, and yet we kind of think they should right. be believers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the case of the Athenians, the situation there was that Paul looks around and sees all these idols, and that would be, in a way, that's, that's the type of events. It says his heart was provoked. In fact, the message was, and I'll share this on Sunday morning, was that, that he was actually infuriated. The word there is infuriated. He was absolutely set on edge. And yet he didn't see them as his enemy. That's what we talked about a week or so ago. He didn't see them as his enemy. He saw, man, they need the truth. And I'm going to find a way to share that with him. There's a great quote out of a book that's called um, What Did You Expect by Paul David Tripp. It's actually on marriage. But he has a great quote in that. He simply says, think about how little of your anger over the last month had anything whatsoever to do with the kingdom of God. And... Obviously, again, that's in the context of a marriage book, of marriage counseling, kind of crisis situations in marriage. Uh, but it really applies, I think, it's just a great quote of how many of the things that have made me angry in the last month, in the last week, in the last day, how many of those things that have made me angry made me angry because it had something to do with the kingdom of God. Um, and and for, for Paul, in this passage, he was infuriated he was angry, he was provoked, but it was all kingdom of God related. And so that's what he went after. Um, and he saw creative ways to, yeah, to address it. That's so good. I think that's something to key in on that. I don't think many of us will have a problem with saying, oh yes, the things that anger God anger me. Because we're going to start thinking of, of the things, like you mentioned, you know, when, when a different political view or a different, you know, oh well, you know, homosexuality and gay marriage is, is this sensitive thing that's right in front of us and yes that makes me angry but does it does it make you angry the way it makes God angry it makes sometimes it makes us angry and it's just a judgmental kind of like hatred towards that person and that is not how it makes God angry it's more of a yeah I mean, the sin of, of course that you know that 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 angers God but but our response I think needs to be more of of a brokenness 
for the brokenness that they have yeah, and, and this, this sense of that there is a better way. And if you only knew, if you only knew rather than, than pointing a judgmental finger. Yeah. You know, and that's not to say to be, to be easy on it or, or to be um, soft on that whole thing, but it's to have that kind of righteous anger that God does of, um, with, the, with the compassion and a right. desire to see restoration that we, we often just brush right over. Yeah. So, so make sure that we key in on that when we, you know, if you hit that in this discussion. Yeah, several of you might have been this week in the, um, uh, last Thursday, you might have been in the, the banquet. Some of you watching right now might have been at the, the Christ Pregnancy Banquet. I happened to be there. And um, really, the, the message I came away with, which was really well handled, I thought, by the, by the center for the banquet, uh, was the idea that... Um, what, what is disturbing about the subject of abortion? Obviously it breaks our heart, lives are lost, and, and none of that is to be overlooked and to be uh, trivialized whatsoever. But the issue is that a young woman, and a young man for that matter, uh, are, are living and acting in a way that is complete uh, rejection of God and His design and His heart. Uh, that's, what, that's what breaks your heart. That's what breaks your heart. I mean. Certainly a lost life is a, is a tragic thing, but what is also tragic is when Christians attack the wrong enemy, mm-hmm. when we attack the wrong enemy. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that was well communicated even at that banquet. The enemy is not this mother or even a father, but the enemy is sin and Satan who chooses to infect us with something that is not what God designed. And so be sure we are attacking the right enemy. Yeah, that's the great. idea. That's great, yep. All right, so moving on to the third question here. This is, why is this account of Paul in Athens so timeless? And how does our culture look so much like that one? What does idolatry today look like? Yeah, this one is, this one is another, hopefully, a good question. It's, it's why, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it's why, that for me, I was challenged to embrace this passage as our passage of focus for this week. Uh, because I do think there is such a parallel, uh, both on the on the unbelieving side of the equation as well as on the believing side of the equation. The unbelieving side of the equation, that is uh, a fear that we are um, almost in a a postmodern context that we doubt everything and so we build an idol, not we, but but our society builds an idol to make sure that some area of uncertainty is not overlooked, a god, a deity. Um, And maybe it's not as direct as a deity for for the Athenians, it really was deity. It really was the idea that there's a God that I don't know out there and I don't want to offend him. I don't know that it's so much as that, that people in our society would call it a deity as much as they would. There, there's nothing of certainty anymore. There, and, and that's a very postmodern feel to it. There's nothing of certainty. And so I'm going to cover all my bases. There is no truth. There's no absolute. It's all relative. Exactly. And, and in, the, in the absence of absolute truth, um, we start filling it with everything. It's, it's the whole expression, right? When, when you don't believe in, in God, you don't not believe in anything. You believe in everything. Everything becomes an option. And, and what I love is that, it, so on the, on the unbelieving side, that's, that's, a, that's a timeless or that's a parallel to what we experience. On the believing side, like us in Paul's shoes, we have the opportunity to engage that. Um, I actually think that postmodernism is the church's Maybe it's best tool because humanism has failed or it is in the process of failing. And that's an opportunity to say, you're right, humanism is going to fail. Yeah. Uh, and so something absolute has to come in from the outside, sort of. So. Yeah, that's good. And I've found personally in, in just sharing with people and trying to, to find those windows into, into speaking truth, getting the gospel into people's lives. That, that when that whole thing breaks down, because it does, it, it's going to break down in everyone's life because it's false, the best window into that, the best opportunity into that is in their brokenness. When it falls apart around them, and they say these things that I believe, these things that I, I think are true that are clearly not, when crisis hits, it all crumbles, and we, can, and we can be there and say, well, let me give you what is true. Here's the foundation. Here's what's actually yeah. you know, reality. And... and in that brokenness, we have a tendency to be able to see a little clearer. And, and uh, not that we want to pray for brokenness, like for bad things to happen to people, but it's going to happen. That's just the way it goes. And, and it's probably best for us to be, you know, we build those relationships and those bridges so that in those moments, 
we're the first one to the accident scene. You know, we're the first one to be there when crisis hits and to comfort them and to be able to say, we, we I actually have something that is valuable to you, that mm -hmm. is truth that we can build that on. Yeah. And that's that's kind good. of our best window into it. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And then the last, the last question on here is in what ways can we model Paul's engagement with the Athenians? This is just a practical kind of, you know, we see how he did it, we see the similarities. How can we apply this? How can we now mimic this and do that in our own culture? Yeah, I, there's a couple things that I would say to this, and this really is a continuation of the of question number three. We're just kind of moving now into Paul's response to it, which in some ways we've already kind of broached. But uh, some things I would say is we, you see in the passage that Paul goes right back, even as his spirit is provoked, he does go back to familiar territory uh, to start building, you know, the case for it. So, so it's for him. It was he still goes into the synagogue and he still. Um, he still dialogues and debates with, with his Jewish brothers and, and, and trying to create maybe a, what appears to be a bit of a groundswell to then move out into the culture. Um, you know, so, so he still operates in a similar way. But then he goes into the marketplace. He, he engages the marketplace ultimately. They take him out into the, the, sea, the Areopagus where they're going to have these kinds of discussions. Uh, and, and, and so he engages them and he looks for, and, and we know this so well, he looks for that one, that one sliver, God, surely, and this is spirit led, I believe it's probably filled with prayer, mm -hmm. which I would think is something we can, which I know that we can mimic from Paul. And that is, where is the sliver? Surely there's an entry point here. And for him, it was among, imagine, imagine God giving him, if there were truly thousands of idols, which they, they think for sure that there were. There were thousands of idols. You know what astounds me is how did he find the one that said to an unknown God? I mean, how did he ever find that? Well, I'll tell you exactly how he found it. God led him to a, an idol, a, a, a statue, whatever it must have looked like, and the inscription was to an unknown God. And a spirit-led mind that Paul clearly had said, there's my inroad. Yeah. And so creativity and uh, observant, to be observant, to be creative, uh, to be ready for the Spirit of God to give us even that sliver of, of an opportunity. We can be like Paul in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Keeping eyes open.